people have never heard of Silverstreak, a male German Shepherd that starred in six motion pictures. He was considered Universal's attempt to rival the success of Warner Brothers' Rin Tin Tin. And the reason you may not have heard of him is not because Warner and Rin Tin Tin won the popularity competition, nor would it be due to the fact that many of today's audiences don't watch silent films. The reason most people have never heard of Silverstreak is because every movie he starred in no longer exists. Based on a study by the Library of Congress, over 75% of silent films made between 1890 and 1930 are considered lost. One major contributing factor to this is that movies were made with highly flammable nitrate film until the early 1950s, and as a result, prints of these silent films were easily destroyed in fires, such as the 1937 Fox Vault Fire. Because every one of Silver Streak's movies were made between 1926 and 1928, it just so happened that all of his movies fell within that 75% statistic of being destroyed. So instead of the several nicknames he had during his career, such as King of Dog Actors, The Dog Wander, or The Wander Dog, it's more appropriate to refer to him as Cinema's Lost Dog. Even though Silver Streak's work has since been destroyed, there are a few surviving remnants that preserve his legacy and perhaps even shroud it in mystery. Production stills are available from his movie Fangs of Justice, in which he stars alongside actress June Marlowe. According to a 1928 article by the Aniston Star, Silver Streak took such a liking to Marlowe that he attempted to stay by her side at every possible moment, which reflected his off-camera reputation of being affectionate and calm. Aside from Fangs of Justice's production stills, newspaper articles and posters can also be found of Silver Streak. And the 10-episode adventure serial, The Silent Flyer, has a trailer which still exists. Silver Streak was born in 1924, the last in a great line of German shepherds that appeared in film. He impressed several professors from the University of California with his intelligence. What with being able to show hate, fear, love, and affection, he was said to be strong enough to throw a well-developed man. In terms of responding to commands, Silver Streak understood over 150 words in German and English, and he only needed to rehearse a scene once before filming. After retiring from the film industry, Silver Streak continued to perform in front of a live audience, which included the trick of him sitting on a chair like a human. It was said during these live shows that his grand finale was playing the piano and singing. Speaking of animals doing tricks in front of live audiences and also appearing in silent films, there is a short black and white documentary that exists, produced by the Edison Film Company in 1903, which depicts an elephant being executed by electrocution. This 74 second motion picture is simply called Electrocuting an Elephant. And even though this documentary and the story behind it fell into obscurity for 70 years, it's now often shown in film study classes due to its chronological significance in motion picture history, not only being one of the first movies ever made, but also, according to a 2013 book by Michael Daly, this event may have been the first time death was ever captured on film. This short film shows the death of an elephant as at the unfinished Luna Park on Coney Island on January 4th, 1903. The elephant was originally intended to be hanged publicly, with onlookers being charged admission. The American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals took issue with publicly hanging an elephant and trying to make a profit off of it. As a compromise of sorts, the execution would go on, but only with press and selected observers to be admitted. Also, instead of hanging the elephant, she would instead be strangled with large ropes tied to a steam-powered winch, which was a sure method of a swift death. To avoid the potential of botching the strangulation, the elephant would also be fed cyanide-laced carrots, then electrocuted, before the strangulation would begin. This creature was Topsy. She was born in Southeast Asia around 1875, making her way to the United States by being secretly sold and added to the herd of performing elephants at the Four Paws Circus, who fraudulently advertised her as the first elephant born in America. At maturity, Topsy was 10 feet high and 20 feet long. In 1902, a year before her death, the killing of spectator James Fielding Blount at the Four Paws Circus was the first event that brought Topsy to prominence. Despite various accounts of this event, 
The most common story is that Blount wandered into the tent that sheltered all of the elephants, where he would begin teasing them, such as offering them whiskey or throwing sand. After Blount threw sand in Topsy's face, he took his lit cigarette and burnt her trunk, an extremely sensitive area to elephants. In response, Topsy threw Blount to the ground with her trunk and then crushed him. Newspapers sensationalized this event by claiming that Topsy had killed up to 12 men prior to Blount, which in turn generated very large crowds to see Topsy at the circus. Topsy got even more attention the following month when, while being unloaded from a train in Kingston, a spectator used a stick to tickle her ear. With her trunk, Topsy seized him around the waist and threw him. Being too much of a liability, Four Paw Circus decided to sell Topsy to Sea Lion Park, which would eventually be renamed Luna Park. There, Topsy was used to move timbers, a public penance for her rampaging ways which the circus owners profited from. At this time, she had a handler named William Alt, though some sources refer to him as William Whitey Alf who would be the instigator of Topsy's continued negative public perception as a poorly behaved animal, which would ultimately be the reason for her execution. One day, while Topsy was moving timbers, Alt stabbed her with a pitchfork. So, the incident resulted in the police getting involved. Not liking being confronted by police, Alt responded to the altercation by letting Topsy loose. Less than two months later, Topsy was let loose again, this time with Alt riding on her back, possibly with the intent of getting her to charge through the local police station. Accounts say Topsy tried to batter her way through the station door, and trumpeted so terrifically that it led to officers taking refuge in the cells. Alt was fired, and now, with Topsy having no handler and an even worse reputation than before, Luna Park's owners claimed they had nobody to take care of the elephant. Due to her public image, they couldn't even give her away for free to another circus or zoo. The rest is history, and even though Topsy had a rough life and a tragic end, her forgotten story has not only had a resurgence, but the film that captured her death ironically immortalized her. And instead of her death being a spectacle nowadays, Days, it has turned into a heavily criticized piece of cinema, acting as a record of the abuse a lot of elephants and circus animals went through. And while similar abuses are still occurring today, they are happening less and less, thanks in part to the trials of Topsy. For another 40 years, Luna Park stood strong. After their competitor Dreamland opened in 1904, all the way through bankruptcy during the Great Depression, Luna Park managed to survive the harsh times. Then, on August 13, 1944, an uncontrollable fire broke out, causing the park to burn down and never reopen. This event would be known as Topsy's Revenge. Someday I will come back. continue to the second half of this video, please make sure to like, subscribe, share, ring the bell, become a patron at my Patreon, and visit my website www.cwschultz.com where you can get to know a little more about me, my four published novels all available at amazon.com, my award nominated film Watch, excerpts from my upcoming fifth book Whispering of the Autumn Leaves, and links to my short stories, such as Rooster, which was featured on the NPR-recognized podcast, Seven Minute Stories. Zatara, or simply Tara, is a female tabby cat adopted by the Triantafilo family in 2008 after she followed them to their home in Bakersfield. On May 13, 2014, the tree into Philo's four-year-old son, Jeremy, was riding his bicycle in the driveway when Scrappy, the neighborhood dog, came at the boy from behind, attacking young Jeremy by the leg and pulling him down the driveway. Then, this happened. Not only did Tara lunge at the dog, she also chased after him. When the dog ran away, Tara immediately returned to Jeremy's side. 
Despite needing 10 stitches, Jeremy quickly recovered, knowing that without Tara's presence, his injuries could have been much worse. The moment was recorded on household surveillance, which received 16.8 million views within 48 hours of the footage being uploaded to YouTube. After learning of the incident, the owners of the eight-month-old Scrappy surrendered him to the city of Bakersfield Animal Care Center on the same day of the attack. Scrappy was required to go through a 10-day quarantine to determine if he had rabies. When footage of the attack went public, calls flooded the Bakersfield Animal Care Center to show the dog mercy, and online petitions and other websites were created to help spare Scrappy's life. People even offered to adopt Scrappy in hopes that it would save him from being put down. Scrappy's quarantine period showed that he was a vicious and dangerous animal and therefore had to be euthanized. Despite having the support from thousands of petition signatures, some of whom were very irate about the decision to put Scrappy to sleep, much of the attention remained on Tara's heroic act. She rose to fame and even somehow managed to throw the first pitch at a Bakersfield minor league baseball game in Sam Lim Ballpark as recognition for her deed. She has since received many awards, including the first ever Cat Hero Award from Cat Fanciers Association, created because of her selfless act. The Blue Tiger Award, even though that's only for military service dogs, she showed up canines again by receiving the Los Angeles SPCA's Hero Dog Award, for which Tara also won a year's supply of cat food. The Bakersfield Board of Supervisors proclaimed June 3rd to be Tara the Hero Cat Day. Due to her hectic schedule, Tara isn't available for interviews. In the spring of 1942, the newly formed Anders Army left the Soviet Union for Iran, accompanied by thousands of Polish civilians who had been deported to the Soviet Union following the 1939 Soviet invasion of eastern Poland. At a railway station in Hamadan, Polish soldiers encountered a young Iranian boy who had found a bear cub whose mother had been shot by hunters. Polish soldiers were convinced by one of the refugees they were traveling with to buy the young bear. The soldiers named the bear Votek, which loosely translates to happy warrior. Votek initially had problems swallowing and was fed condensed milk from an old vodka bottle. During such a time of struggle, it was difficult to feed starving people who were consistently on the go, let alone a growing bear. In order to provide for Votex rations and transportation, he was eventually enlisted as a soldier with the rank of private and was subsequently promoted to corporal. Like many of his fellow soldiers, he took a liking to drinking coffee in the mornings, as well as cigarettes, and not just smoking them, but also eating them. The lit ones, that is. If they were unlit, he'd just spit them back out. Votek was very affectionate, being quite the cuddler on cold nights, and also quite playful, learning how to wrestle and salute, and even did tricks for beer. After observing his fellow soldiers lifting crates, he began to copy them. During the Battle of Monte Cassino, Votek helped his unit to convey ammunition by carrying 100-pound crates of artillery shells, never dropping any of them. After the end of World War II, Votek was given to Edinburgh Zoo, where he spent the rest of his life, often visited by journalists and former Polish soldiers, some of whom tossed cigarettes for him to eat. You know, for old times' sake. Votek was a frequent guest on BBC Television's Blue Peter program for children. Many plaques and sculptures have been made in memory of the soldier bear. Votek has since been the subject of pop culture, not just with television programs, but also movies and music. Perhaps one of the most fitting examples of his legacy came when the Krakow City Council agreed to erect a statue of Votek, unveiling it at the 70-year anniversary of the Battle of Monte Cassino, where Votek helped lift crates. This, by the way, isn't Votek's only statue. Efron was an ocean quahog clam dredged off the coast of Iceland. By the amount of lines on the shell, called annual growth lines, it was observed by researchers that Efron was no ordinary clam. Hafron was taken to Bangor University for further examination. Unaware of how old and fragile it was, researchers opened its shell, whereupon it died. 
While this was devastating, Professor Richardson said that Efron's discovery could be critical in understanding how certain animals can reach such an advanced age, perhaps in hopes of prolonging other animals' lives, including humans. Using the aforementioned annual growth lines, researchers initially estimated Heffron was 405 years old. Afron was so old that Sunday Times journalists instead referred to the clam as Ming, in reference to the Ming Dynasty during which it was born. In 2013, another assessment of Heffron's age was carried out this time comparing the lines with older clams that were still alive, and also backed by carbon-14 dating. This narrowed down Afron's age to a far more precise estimation, with only a 1-2 to two year margin of error, concluding that, at the time Afron was caught, the clam was actually 507 years old. <laughs>